Man, the MCU sucks now! That's a phrase you see and hear off repeated online, and maybe you've wondered, is it true? Or are those toxic fanboy incels just unable to handle the raw, awesome female power of the MC uterus? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely true. You're not just nostalgic. MCU Phases 4 and 5 took a sharp turn down in terms of quality, and today let's look at a pair of scenes where characters were introduced to show just how bad things have gotten. As we compare these two scenes, look at how it used to be about the character and connecting with them, and now it's just about the plot and things happening just because things need to happen. For a good example, we're going to examine the introduction of Ruffalo Hulk from Avengers 2012. This scene introduces Bruce Banner and deepens our understanding of existing character Natasha. Our bad example is a great contrast because it also introduces a new character, Ironheart, and tries to deepen our understanding of existing character Okoye. Let's start on a happy note and explore this scene in 2012's Avengers where Black Widow has been sent by Nick Fury to fetch Bruce Banner. As we go, it's important to remember that this scene openly says quite a bit, but doesn't flat out tell you everything. When this movie was written, Marvel trusted its audience to pick up on some context. Now, I trust you're going to hit the like button if you're enjoying this video, but I understand sometimes a reminder is helpful. This is said reminder. The first thing we see about Banner is that he's treating poor people in what appears to be India. We're introducing a hero here, and we already see his Doctors Without Borders game is flawless. A little girl gets his attention, clearly desperate for his help. As she's leading him to a house, we see him stop her from getting run over, but also turn away from the military vehicle that's passing by. He's watching out for little girl, but also clearly worried about authority for some reason. This is the kind of nonverbal subtext that makes a good scene. We get inside the building, and the little girl runs off, but Banner takes it and stride, which is when Natasha speaks up. Now, we see a couple of interesting things happening. First, Banner's not surprised to see this obvious agent here, but he is nervous. He's fidgeting with his hands the entire time. He's looking in every direction. He tells her it's smart that they brought her to the edge of the city and leaves off what we, the audience, know. This is because he will do less damage here if things go sideways. He's paranoid. He asks Natasha if the building is surrounded while looking all around and out the window. Now we start to learn more things about Natasha than the previous scene, which has her answering the phone call, beating up her kidnappers who were supposedly interrogating her, but she was actually playing them. She not only bribed the little girl to lure Banner to the house, but also lies to his first question about the house being surrounded, as we'll see. When he asks if all spies start as young as the girl, she says she did. Now we're going to talk more about Johansson's acting soon, but her delivery of this line is great, showing just enough regret and humanity to connect with the audience and Banner. While telling him the house isn't surrounded, she says we're all alone, while tossing aside her shawl. Now we've already learned that she's been a spy all her life. Her first move is allure, and she lies to get what she wants. Pretty classic secret agent stuff, but all in just a few seconds. We get a little back and forth between them, and Bruce is clearly cagey, and he's not responding to romantic advances. So, she just gets blunt, explaining about the Tesseract and how Fury wants Banner to find it. She's trying to subtly manipulate him the whole time. First with her body, then telling him S.H.I.E.L.D. has been protecting him, then flattery, telling him he knows more about gamma radiation than anyone, and the world needs him. What's most important in the scene is what it tells us about Bruce's motivations and beliefs. In order to really connect with a character, we need to know exactly how they see the world. During their exchange, they're testing each other. Bruce asks if she's going to try to kill him and warns her that's not going to go well for anyone. He doesn't say this in an intimidating way, just a statement of fact and one that he looks a little regretful about. These statements, him remarking on being at the edge of the city, his hiding from the jeep, they all tell us that this character is afraid of himself and mistrustful of authority. He's afraid of what someone might do with him if he were captured or what he would accidentally do to get away. He doesn't trust authority, but he does want to help people. This is the worldview and core belief of this character, and it informs all of his actions. This scene tells us all of this, and much of it doesn't come from the dialogue. Okay, so now the movie has told us out loud that Bruce knows more about Gamma than anyone, but they need to show us that he's smart. He does this by calling all her bluffs, cutting her off mid-sentence, slamming his hands on the table, and shouting, STOP LYING TO ME! His move works, exposing her completely. She immediately grabs a gun from under the table, and he chuckles a little bit, looking a little embarrassed, apologizing for being mean to her. Now, of all the things going on in the scene, Scarlett Johansson is putting on some outstanding acting, managing to simultaneously look furious at him and herself for being exposed, looking ashamed for getting caught, and scared out of her freaking mind with the knowledge that the Hulk could come out any moment, and her remains would likely be identified by random limbs that might be found afterward. Natasha calls off the soldiers outside, which we see were indeed surrounding the 
place, Bruce gets the last line of, hmm, we're all alone, huh? With very little dialogue, we've made Bruce look caring, smart, dangerous, and fully in control of himself and the situation. But he didn't need to pull a kitten from a tree, spout a bunch of scientific jargon, or destroy anything. We've also expanded on Black Widow as a secret agent who will do what it takes and adapt to the situation to handle a mission. All of this takes Four minutes. Now let's turn to Ironheart, Shuri, and Okoye. We start out with the new trend of making our strong female character really tough and cold and frankly a dick. Apparently the only way to be strong is to be severely masculine. The previous scene with Agent Ross told us explicitly that she's the only person in the world that can build a vibranium finding machine. Okay. So we introduce the character by having her strut up to a student and snatch his phone and start sending herself money. He gives some weak excuse for trying to not pay her, but he's clearly intimidated by her despite being taller and obviously stronger. He says he'll pay her the $800, but she says that was yesterday's price. It's a ban today. She reminds me of Toothpick, and he was supposed to be a parody. Phone check, homie, phone check. $5 a head. We're told she fixed the algorithm for the guy's robotic hand and he got a great grade. That's how we know she's super smart. Just a quick side note, algorithm can usually be replaced with flowchart or decision chart. You ever see one of these diagrams with the diamonds and the boxes? That's an algorithm. But writers like to use that word to signal something is advanced almost as much as they like the prefix nano. So we cut to Shuri and Okoye trying to blend in by standing next to a luxury sports car and commenting on how Riri's iPhone is primitive. That's how we know their tech is advanced. But if you didn't catch it, don't worry, they also state that MIT is the equivalent of a Wakandan village school. Okay. Oh, once again, this reminds me of a character that is meant to parody self-important characters. Let me put it this way. Have you ever heard of Plato? Aristotle? Socrates? Yes. Morons. I would say that I feel like actual teenagers wrote this, but I have actual teenagers, and they write better. Thanks, IEW. Shuri and Okoye re-emphasize that Riri is young, and then we get a great comedy bit that fits the tone of the scene and movie perfectly. First, Shuri and Okoye argue about who should go and who is more discreet, again, while leaning against a car that appears to cost a half a million dollars. Then Okoye very naturally brings up her makeup, and in a blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment, Shuri assures her that her Fenty makeup is the right shade. Pulitzer winning stuff here. Always a good sign when a huge company puts blatant advertisements in the middle of their production. Then, if you take something already delicious like cup noodles and add in the finest, freshest ingredients, what do you get? The ultimate flavor experience. Shuri ends up winning the argument and heads to Riri's room. Riri says that she doesn't take walk-ins. Whoever's at the door needs to schedule through the website. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about subtle hints around a character. I'm not certain if you've picked up on this, but Riri is extremely smart. So smart that she's making money on the side by doing schoolwork for her classmates. She's extremely in demand. So in demand that she's built a website to handle requests from lesser students to fix their broken algorithms and such. I'm sorry to take up so much of the video time, but these facts have been woven in so subtly, almost unnoticeably. I, I was just worried you wouldn't see them. As Shuri walks into the room, we discover that it was a good idea for her to discreetly come because Riri recognizes her immediately and says, Are you Princess Shuri? Then she starts asking if she's being recruited. But when Shuri asks her about making a vibranium finding machine for the CIA, she is confused. It's very obvious that the Princess of Wakanda would want to recruit her, but anything with the CIA, totally out of the question. This dialogue makes perfect sense. Riri explains that she didn't sell it. She made it for a school project for her metallurgy class. Her professor didn't think she could do it. <laughs> he had the gall to doubt a strong female character. <laughs> what a rube. But alas, she sighs. That's what it is to be young, gifted, and black. The professor said I'd never be able to do it. To be young, gifted, and black, though, right? I put that clip there in case you thought, surely a billion dollar company didn't hire professional writers and spend over $200 million on a movie where a 19-year-old character says about herself, Ah, to be young, gifted, and black. That's not real. Right, Rocket? It's real! There may be a day when I can't use that joke and clip combo when talking about Disney, but it is not this day. Of course, Shuri supports her in this idiotic idea, agreeing that brilliance at a young age is not often accepted by the elders. Her professor doubted her because she is young and black, not because she claimed she was going to build a machine to detect the rarest metal in the world that most of the world didn't even know existed until very recently. The professor also definitely didn't assume it would be difficult to build a machine to detect a material that MIT doesn't even have lying around because it's the rarest metal in the world. Nope! This curmudgeonly old teacher doubted her because she's young and black. There can be no other explanation. We're introducing a new character, and so far, we know about her that she's a bully and thinks she's the main character in everybody else's story. 
awesome. I can't wait to get to know this character more. So we discover she thinks everyone is looking down on her and doubts her genius. But as soon as we learn this core belief for the character, it is instantly solved because she did invent the thing and everyone is super impressed by her. Storytelling 101 is that you want to introduce a flaw in a character and then solve it immediately so the audience doesn't have to wait around. That's just efficient, you know? This is this is really good time management. So there's, there's no connection to this character. Having an internal conflict where you want to prove yourself can be a great character device and possible weakness to exploit. That's what made Tony Stark's journey so compelling, but none of that is introduced in Ironheart. She doesn't need to prove herself because she already has. She has no self-doubt. She has a version of respect. We see the boy is intimidated by her. Her school services are in demand. She is completely unlikable, but doesn't have any internal conflict to grow her character. This is what a Mary Sue is. It's not about being overpowered. It's about having no internal conflict or flaws to build an arc. That is why these types of characters are so boring. In the future, I'm going to do a whole comparison between Iron Man and Iron Heart. But in this scene, we are given no information about Riri's beliefs or worldview that will inform her future decisions, which is good for the writers because she can just do whatever the plot needs and they aren't hampered by silly things like character consistency. Now, at this point, if you're not certain that Riri is smart, and that would be understandable because the dialogue has been barely sneaking in hints, there is one final piece of dialogue that might clue you in. She makes an excuse that she needs to leave because she has differential equations class, which is supposed to make the character sound smart. And here is where we see that it's difficult to hint that a character is brilliant in a way that the whole audience gets, but without making up silly jargon. Differential equations are certainly not easy. They are taught in calculus class. The better course would be to simply say, I'm late for calculus, or just... I'm late for class. But these writers are so desperate to broadcast the stunning genius of their new character, they had to try to go the extra mile. So she attempts to leave the room and is met by a Koye who has decided to pack her crazy eyes. It is at this point, if Will Shatner were on set, he would advise Riri and Okoye both to tone down the overacting because she starts screaming, Get out. Get out of my dorm. And grabs a radio to threaten them. Them, including the princess of Wakanda that she's been talking to this whole time. I think this is supposed to be comedy? She throws the radio, and Okoye cuts it in half with her expanded spear, which then prompts an argument between her and Shuri. Okoye tells the audience that we're supposed to like Riri, at least she does. Where have I seen this before? I like this one. Ah, right, and it worked! The audience loves Captain Marvel. Okoye threatens her to go to Wakanda conscious or unconscious. I love how everyone here is very tough and aggressive and shouts exactly what they're thinking. It's a very pleasant viewing experience, and I am learning so much about these characters. Finally, we get some more comedy when Ironheart asks about the ash on Okoye's head. That's right, we're back to talking about the makeup. So this scene has taught us next to nothing about these characters, and any problems that get brought up are already solved. Ironheart seems like a horrible person that you'd not want any anything to do with, but you're told to like her because Okoye does. Koye also comes off as abrasive and rude and aggressive. Everyone is aggressive. That's what makes a character strong, don't you know? Shuri is barely worth mentioning because she doesn't even do anything in this scene. They obviously want to set her up as like a mentor style character for Ironheart, but they were so desperate to make Riri brilliant, the two characters are already pretty close to the same level, so Shuri has nothing to add. What really strikes me is how these characters will not shut up. There is very little time for the audience to notice anything because it's being thrown at them verbally over and over and over. In the Hulk intro, there are about 380 words in four minutes, roughly 1.58 words per second. In the Ironheart intro, we get about 510 words in four and a half minutes for roughly 1.87 words per second. There is 20% more dialogue in the Ironheart scene. Where the Hulk introduction gives us a meek but highly competent Bruce Banner that you might be rooting for, the Ironheart intro gives us an angry, narcissist narcissistic genius without any of the aloof charm of a Tony Stark. We know Riri is a genius because we are told again and again. In the Hulk intro, we are told he's smart once when Natasha says he knows more about Gamma than anyone. And then we are shown once when he exposes her. In the Ironheart intro, we are directly told twice that she is smart and then indirectly hinted at it five more times. I'm being very generous calling those indirect hints. The Hulk intro gives us insight into the character's worldview and his weaknesses that will be used to grow him later. The Ironheart intro tells us that she has no weaknesses. How the world sees her is the problem, but that problem has already been overcome before the movie even starts. The Hulk intro reinforces what we know about a side character, that she will change tactics and do what is needed for a mission. The Ironheart intro makes a side character look vain and unhinged. The writing at Disney has fallen off a cliff, and that includes Star Wars. Join me next time, we'll compare scenes to show how 
Ahsoka trying to do the blind lightsaber training was terrible. Subscribe so you get notified. I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time.